Hello, Hello. everyone. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Get You Some Productions podcast, episode 36, podcast and vlog, as it were. We are a podcast and vlog now uh, from time to time, covering all things related to music production from the very first note played or written to the very last fan lost or won. We create music and inspire and seek to inspire others to do the same. Every single episode, well, I shouldn't say every single episode. Some episodes are just me and Dan bullshitting and some episodes are interviews, but many episodes are actually live business meetings where we are attempting to build a media empire right before your very eyes and ears. Uh, hi guys, that's Keith. He was, you just listened to Keith. My name's oh, Daniel. My, my name's Keith. Um, I'm supposed to say my name's Keith. <laughs> that's, and my name's Daniel. And um, Keith isn't just holding up this book, you know, cause he's, he's mental. We're actually gonna be discussing this book today. Um, check out the affiliate link below. Also hit that subscribe and like button um, below. Makes a huge difference for us. I wanna mention our affiliate reverb.com before we get started. Um, fantastic resource if you're looking for um, musical gear. And um, if you, you know, click the link and um, purchase through uh, our link provided, you know, we get a little cut. It doesn't cost you any, anything extra. Or if you sign up for an account there through us, we also get a little commission. Um, Reverb.com is great, guys, um, because the big box stores have what they have. But Reverb.com um, gets all those local mom and pop shops all around the country and all the, 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 the cool stuff you want to find. And, you know, you're, you, you know, you'll be supporting some smaller businesses out there, too. Um, so again, all the links down below, um, for that stuff. And without further ado, let's get into, uh, this podcast where we, we will be reviewing this book, um, Locking Creativity by Michael Beinhorn. Beinhorn. I think it's Beinhorn. Beinhorn. All right. Keith, let's get, a, get, let's get us started here. So let's just um i'm gonna i want to start just by saying that you know this is um this like i said in the intro this is supposed to be a uh production music production podcast where we're building a media empire uh right before your very eyes and ears and so part of that journey is dan and i learning about um music production so we're going to do, this is sort of like the first episode of a series where we review a book and we cover some topics within the book and yeah. we learn right before your eyes and you can buy this book. There'll be an affiliate link in the description. Uh, you can buy this book and learn along with us and read along with us. We're going to probably cover it chapter, chapter by chapter and you can go and find a playlist. I'll build a playlist. Uh, so you can go and watch them one by one and you can come to your own conclusions about the book, but you can also uh, hear our thoughts and maybe that'll get you, get your mind going about certain things. So I, I actually read it and I, I circled and underlined a bunch of things. Oh, you did? That I wanted to cover. Yeah. So okay. is, is that comfortable for you or did you want to like, did you have any general thoughts that you wanted to? Just shoot I just out wanted to or? confirm that today we're going to be discussing like the introduction to the book. Just the intro. Okay. Uh, good. Good. I did read the introduction and I'm uh, well into, uh, I even have a bookmark. Oh, wow. Let's see the bookmark um, unless it's not safe. It's just a paper, it's literally a paper clip. I'm just a few pages into chapter one, but yeah, I did do the oh, whole, nice. uh, I did do the whole, uh, introduction and, um, uh, let me just, uh, let me, bounce off of what you're going to say, since you've already got some stuff highlighted. Yeah, because okay. I, I thought, yeah. you know, there was, the, it seemed like the intro was in a couple different sections. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so and, and actually it importantly describes what the book's about in some respects. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was helpful. So first of all, this guy, Michael Beinhorn, Michael Beinhorn, uh, the book is called Unlocking Creativity. So the guy, Michael Beinhorn, it says um, for over a third of a century, so for over 33 years, 33 and a third years, this guy's been producing records. So I guess the first thing I wanted to say is that he's got some 
you know, he's got some um, time in the business. Yeah, um, let just, me jump in. I mean, uh, not just to, to be vague there, but it specifically lists Herbie Hancock, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Soul Asylum, Hole, Soundgarden, Ozzy, Marilyn Manson, and many more. So did that list it in, in the version of the book you see, or did you just look at his... I didn't read the back. Oh, yeah, Herbie Hancock, Chili yeah, yeah, Peppers, I mean, Soul Asylum, Hole, Soundgarden, yeah. Social uh, Distortion, Corn and Mew. What is Mew? I don't I've never know. heard the band Mew. I, I don't know. It must be something the kids listen to these days. Um, yeah. So, uh, but anyway. So this guy, this guy's had been nominated for some Grammys, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so he's, you know, he's got some stuff going on. And actually, the reason why I bought the book in the first place was I heard an interview with the guy and he sounded like he, was, he knew what he was doing. So the second thing is um, he writes, the truth is, uh, I was only good as a record producer when I viewed it as an artistic process. It only worked for me when I treated it as a form of my own personal expression. So I'm going to read that again. The truth is, this record producing was only a, only good as a he was only good as a record producer when he viewed it as an artistic process, and it only worked for him when he treated it as a form of his own personal artistic expression. So to, like, I thought that was important because this book is not, he's telling us right up front, this book is not about the preamps. It's not about which microphones. It's about the act of producing as an artist. So I felt like this is a good first book for us to read, um, Dan and I, because it's so, it's more than just, it's, it's more foundational than choosing the microphones, you know, where to put a microphone, you know, it's like, that'll all come. And in, in a sense, it's like, and actually what it brings to mind is like all those records that, you know, maybe you and I probably loved that weren't the highest quality, let's say, mm -hmm. but we loved them because there was something more to it. You know, all the, bootleg tapes I can remember listening to that were not high, super high record production quality, but there was something more to it. So I think like for me and you, it'd be good to focus on something as our foundation, to focus on something that's more than just like technique, more than just, you know, equipment, something that goes deeper, you know, something that connects to us, um, right. our humanity or something. I don't know. Well, yes, I mean, because, and more specifically, you're talking about the differentiation between engineering and production. There is obviously crossover. I mean, that's all, he's talking all about the crossover. Um, but yeah. um, exactly, you picked up right on one of the first things I noticed in the introduction that made a deal like it would be appropriate. It's not, um, not only it's not gonna be about the technical stuff, um, but about artistic intention and creativity. Yeah. Creativity. It's the biggest, biggest word on the cover. Right, right. So yeah, that, uh, <laughs> that should be a hint. Yeah, and yeah. also it's sort of like a dream of mine, I guess, is that not only well, this is a production company and maybe we can learn some artistic, creative processes to draw some creativity out of ourselves, but also, you know, would be cool if we actually get this thing running to the point where we can actually produce other artists' work we would have some skills and a framework where we would be able to um, draw out of them their maximum potential. Right. So um, should I go on to the next quote? Hell yeah. This is, so um, he writes, this is the main reason I wanted to write this book to bring to light exactly what this process is and how to use it wisely and creatively as it pertains to record production. The process starts with knowing exactly who you are in relation to your work. In my case, I discovered I'm not a businessman. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm an artist. That's all I ever really wanted to be in the first place. And so the reason I chose that was just like making artistry, putting artistry at the core 
Um, even though, and I think I tend to focus on business a lot actually within this podcast. Um, so, but nevertheless, this is an artistic expression. So I think we need to put that at the core. I didn't really have any further, you know, feedback on this particular selection. Um, yeah. But just putting artistry at the core and cre putting the creative process at the core. I think it's more fun that way anyway. Yeah, I agree. And I have to say that sentence that you just read there, um, that's what kind of got me hooked. On, on the book. Uh, yeah, because yeah. I identified with that um, right away. Yeah. You know, I was like, oh, I, I agree with that. I think that's something that me and uh, this guy have in common. Yeah. Uh, I see myself at the core, you know, as an artistic person. Um, I often, yeah. uh, I often envy or not envy it, admire the mindset of people who are naturally entrepreneurs. They just have a way of creating concepts and bringing them through willpower and everything else that that is mm -hmm. organization into fruition. And that's not something that I do naturally. And I really admire that. And then there's, um, like you, Keith, there's a lot I admire about you. You're just like your business, your understanding of how business works. And there's a mm -hmm. lot of intricacies and mindset to that. And mm -hmm. I admire that. But artists, I identify with that. So I really mm -hmm. love that sentence. I was like, well, if, he's, if that's in his introduction, um, th then it bodes well for, you know, what the content of this book is going to be. If he's, he's approaching everything um, yeah. for that. Um, and then, so I'm interested to see as this book goes on, um, how relatable a lot of this stuff is because he's obviously at a very high level in the industry. And I'm, I'm interested to see if he's going to bring that down to someone who's at the ground floor mm -hmm. and provide inspiration, or if this is more for like people who are kind of going already and looking for the next level, like mm -hmm. I'm just interested to see where this goes and we don't know. I mean, we're going to read the book and we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, so for me that's important because um other than my other than and i've shared most of these experiences with you keith with mm -hmm. just a few exceptions all of my professional music production experiences mm -hmm. uh can be summed up in like a handful of studio recording sessions uh or i should say about a dozen or so over the years you know and then our live shows live 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 shows. that's where most of my stuff that's my studio stuff you know is it's this big you know, compared to a lot of recording artists. Um, but, you know, often I feel like I don't want to leave the studio. Like, I don't I want it to ever be over. I want to stay in that studio and keep producing. So I agree. I love it there. I wish I had more time in the studio. Um, so I don't know what else to say about the intro other than, um, other than uh, it's, it's piqued my interest. Yeah. I no. think, and I, and I, I'll go back, I'll, I'll piggyback on what you just said, because I think, you know, one of my dreams also is that and I, I always want to focus on like, how can we dream to make this a big thing? Um, and being in the studio is great fun. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if we can build this around a goal where we do spend a lot of time in a studio one way or another, you know, right. or if, if it helps facilitate that in some way, you know, that could be uh, a good thing. So um, I'm going to move on to the next quote. So this is a, the world, he writes, the world looks chaotic. This is something that I wrote down. I circled it because I couldn't help but read it a bunch of times because it was like perplexing and it caused me to think a lot. The world looks chaotic and meaningless to one who seeks knowledge from masters who don't provide deeper explanations for their actions or insight into their creative process. My goal is to expose the creative motivation and intent that influences the choices great producers make when producing great records. That's on page three. Mm -hmm. So I just, I'll read it again because it's so crazy. The world looks chaotic and meaningless to one who seeks knowledge from masters who don't provide deeper explanations for their actions or insight into their creative process. Mm -hmm. My goal is to expose the creative motivation and intent that influences the choices great producers make when producing great records. Uh, I see where he's going with that. You do? Yeah. Um, Go for it. Because he goes on to talk about 
it, how it's not about where to put the mics and which microphones. It's about the artistic intent behind decision, behind engineering decisions. Mm -hmm. But if you just go in and start trying to understand all of the decisions, like it led to this, I made this sound. Yeah, but that's not the point. The point is you need to know why. Mm -hmm. It's just going to look chaotic. It's going to look like an endless list of details. You know what I mean? And, and it's going to be chaotic and it will not necessarily ever apply to anything you're doing, you know? Yeah. So, um, I'm pretty sure that's where he's going um, with that. That's, I, I agree with that. I, I, um, I, when he wrote the world looks chaotic and meaningless, I had to read that a bunch of times, but I think that's exactly right. What you say is that if you just have a whole book that's spent on the technique of it, and many do, and many have videos and whole, whole YouTube channels devoted to what, you know, hurts needs to be eliminated for which, you know, for which thing. And it's like, you can, you can spend a lot of time on those details and create something that is mathematically correct from some standpoint, you know, it's like, it's, it's quantitatively correct in, in a way, or it's, it, or there's some evidence-based quantitative thing behind why all these ingredients went in, but you, the end result is not really those quantitative things. The end result That's is, right. did you communicate the emotions of the music? Like, did it come through? And that's why a lot of those choices are secondary because you can, if you, if you don't have something like this at the core of what you do, you'll end up with something that is literally meaningless to a human being. It's just like, it's like the equivalent of a word salad. It's a sound salad. It's mm -hmm. not real music because it really didn't deliver the emotional content, whatever that means. It could mean it makes you cry or it makes you dance, whatever it is. It didn't connect with you on a human level, even though it was all the exact right frequencies to, to like coordinate with this frequencies your the human ear can, you know, can, yeah, can yeah. absorb, which is basically what all that stuff comes down to anyway. Like mic placement. It's like, oh, we doubled up these frequencies and we should eliminate them because they're duplicative and they're creating, you know, they're creating... Um, too much muddiness or it's creating uh, it's it's getting it's getting um, distort it's creating distortion in that frequency range and it's like yeah but all that is actually literally like secondary in that it can't even come you shouldn't even bother with it until you get that emotional content down because it is literally meaningless to a human being if you don't deliver the primary function of music and art in general. Right. So, and uh, it's mentioned, it's, it's interesting that you mention art in general because uh, the subtitle to this book is a uh, producer's guide to making music and art. Okay. Yeah. So they went out of their way to specifically mention art mm -hmm. separate from music. Mm -hmm. um, so that bodes well that this book won't become, is not going to be bogged down in music production and uh specifically engineering recording mm -hmm. engineering process because um i don't need that in my life right now <laughs> mm -hmm. other than maybe some engineering help to get us better podcasting quality yeah. um, but, but um yeah so um it does sound like you and i picked up on the same same things i mean yeah. i think it was a well-written um introduction mm -hmm. and uh it's clear that this, this man is passionate, mm -hmm. like really emotionally invested mm -hmm. in what he, he does. And um, I think he's, if my takeaway is that he, he's embraced his emotional connection to it and is trying to um, help other people understand and nurture their emotional connection to the music and help that um, emotion in humanity, help that mm -hmm. drive the decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, technical decisions like provide the inspiration for technical decisions and i um there's a lot more there's there's 
there's like human resources stuff in here, obviously on its way, like how to handle the artists and, and all that. Um, it's, I can tell <clears> that's <throat> coming too. Cause that's I, obviously a big part of it. Yeah. Um, I'm excited for that stuff. Cause I feel like it'll help us handle people we work with. Yeah. It'll hand, help us handle each other. It'll help us handle ourselves. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't want to skip ahead too much, but yeah. I, I can already tell that um, chapter one is going to provide uh, also have a great, um, uh, a lot, a lot, a lot for us to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. So um, it's just a three-page introduction. So I don't know if there's that much more. Did you have another quote? I see. I like have two more yeah. quotes. Two more. Let's hit them. Let's do them. Yeah, I have two more quotes. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is a paragraph that I sort of put brackets around on page five, but and, and uh -huh. then I underlined a quote. He writes, "And for music." to naturally communicate kinetically, we must find a path back to helping a creative artist commit emotionally to her own work, to help her truly invest in her creative process and to outline an ethical and holistic approach to record making. This is what we'll explore in this book. Um, and so I, there's a couple of things that sort of grabbed me about that. Number one, he writes, and for music to naturally communicate kinetically. And I was thinking, I was reflecting on the fact that music is a kinetic experience. Our emotion inherently, and I had to think about this. I was on the bus coming home from work and I, I sat there and thinking, thinking about it, like, what does he mean by kinetically? And I was thinking, well, our motivations, our emotions are like a potential energy. Music is the kinetic energy. It is a kinetic manifestation of that potential energy. You know, mm -hmm. we can put it out. We can put it out there in conversation. We can put it out there by exercising, by meditating, by beating the shit out of somebody, or we can put it out there in music. So I don't know, just, it just, it, I guess I just was reflecting on the fact that it literally is a kinetic manifestation of our human emotion. Well, yeah. And also, uh, as opposed to, um, you can have an expression like, uh, this book or a painting mm -hmm. and that's still going to be a manifestation of human emotion, but it's not kinetic. It's static. Okay. Music doesn't exist like that. Music flows by in time. It's in movement and you have right. to experience it as it passes by. You want to re-listen, you have to go back. Yeah. It's not like a painting, you know, which you do experience you create your own timeline when you look at a painting. You look at this, you look at that, and you create yeah. a time, passage of time, but it itself is there. And uh, it's not better or worse than music. It's just different. It's not kinetic. It's static. Absolutely um, true. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in other words, you, you actually yeah. have to, like you can't experience music yeah. without putting, it doesn't exist at all without the input of energy. You know, yeah. technically speaking, a painting or any physical manifestation is subject to entropy. This book will fall there. It, there is an energy that's stored in here that, you know, is going to that's it's essentially stored, but it's not kinetic. Right. In a sense. But there is energy stored in any physical manifestation in the world. And then eventually entropy will break it down. But music doesn't exist at all unless there's an input of energy at all times, which makes it fundamentally different. So oh. I, I appreciate your comment about that because I hadn't yeah. occurred to me. Good, um, good. Um, okay. And I wanted to That's make another comment book. about that. Yeah. So he, 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 un, he says that he wants to outline an ethical and holistic approach to record making. I, there was a lot of in this introduction about how record companies have gone sour um, you know, and, and how there's, um, how music has, how this, you know, it, to, to paraphrase, like the soul of music has been extracted and how record companies don't proper, potentially don't properly support true art artistry, but rather have become a commercial and commoditized yes, yes. industry. Yes, create a commodity. Yeah. I purposely didn't underline those because I didn't want to have to focus on the negative 
but I did underline this holistic and ethical approach to record making because I did want to highlight the positive aspect of it where, you know, he goes on to say something and I can't remember like the highest calling of a record production company and a management company is to give the artist, um, facilitate the artist's fullest expression, but not get in the way. So to be the infrastructure, to be the mechanism, to be the funding source, but not to put a bit, not to impose a business um, agenda into the record making, whatever that means, you know, but a lot of times it happens nowadays, clearly. So I just thought it was interesting and important to highlight that rather than complaining about the negativity in the music industry, that we should just rather have that be a focus of, you know, always making art for art's sake in some sense, you know, yeah. even, you know, I'm, I'm not against making music for, for, I'm not against me at all popular music and making music for, 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 con, for mass consumption. I actually yeah. think pop music is great, but I don't, but I want to make the best pop music we can possibly make that is palatable to all ears but but the but the emotionality the 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 artistry is not subverted in any way you know and right. maybe th there's a fine right. line it depends on the artist like you could really truly have artistic inspiration that happens to pretty much follow the thread of what is already popularly palatable yeah there's no if you're expressing yourself and like you're 100% like i am pop you know what I mean? Like I channel that and it is 100%. <laughs> I just love it. I love yeah. it. Love it. And it's, that's your emotion. Like, all right, get, let's get out of their way and record and we'll make some pop music, you know, and it's not and compromising anything artistically for you. Cause that's, that's what you're about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. But that's so, great. And I like that you're focusing on the positive there. Yeah. Nice. All right. So you see, you have one more, uh, one more. So, this is the last quote. It's actually the last paragraph in the introduction. Okay. He writes, that's one more thing this book is about. Not simply my perspective on making records, not just the credo or intent that drives my creative process, not just interesting ways to affect change in creative situations and the creative process of others. Right. It's also about what the creative process feels like when I am or you are in the midst of it. Oh. Um, yeah, so I thought that was interesting because also it, do, it he goes through what the book is about by saying it's not just about these things. Okay. So it's important for listeners and watchers of this podcast to sort of, if they want to buy the book, they can you can click the link, the affiliate link, and, and help us out. Um, you don't have to, of course, but if you want to buy the book, it's important for us to deliver what is this book ultimately about? And he sort of boils it down here. Um, it's, it's not simply his perspective on making records. It is his perspective on making records. It's this man's perspective on making records. Right. It is not just, but it is about his credo or his intent that drives his creative process. And it's not just interesting ways, but it clearly is interesting ways to affect change in creative situations. That's most interesting to me. Um, and the creative processes of others. You're sitting in the um, in the control room, and you know the drummer is having a block. And what are strategies to help you get through that situation? It feels, and I can say for me, for my, I'll just reflect on my own experience. It feels desperate and amorphous, and 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 hard to grasp that situation where something's not happening for my own in my own experiences and dan you were there yeah times we were in the studio and it wasn't happening the music wasn't happening and i was stuck what are ways to get through that and and get the magic take what are some strategies i believe he covers stuff like that in here it's interesting you mentioned that, Keith, because um, as we've been talking, I've been thinking about how much we would have benefited from having a producer 
Yeah. In a lot of those situations, we didn't have one. We're producing it ourselves. And uh, Raj and Nick specifically had a lot of ideas on how to produce. You know what I mean? Yeah. They didn't necessarily know how to manage people um, and help yeah. us. So, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, anyway, yeah, I, I've been in that situation. Yeah. Um, uh, I do remember one time I had that similar thing um, when we were at Justin's place and I was laying down bass. Mm -hmm. one of your songs and I guess I knew the song well enough for us to be rehearsing it but when it came down to like getting it recorded I guess mm -hmm. maybe I won't I don't want to say I didn't do my homework but it wasn't working what song was and it it turned out I believe it was electricity mm -hmm. or um it was just one part of a song and okay. I, the phrasing wasn't right. It wasn't doing it. I think even at this point, Justin was like, geez, what's up with Dan as a bass player? When he saw us live, he's like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like he would, whatever. But I was having that feeling. Um, and uh, literally, you've known me for so many years at that point. Mm -hmm. You knew what to do. You knew what to do. You just wrote a few lines. You're like, if you did this, you knew I'm open to that. Mm -hmm. Then I'm not going to be like, how, why would you show me a baseline? Mine. <laughs> I'm not like that. You know what I'm, if I'm like, I need help or I'm not, I didn't say I need help. Mm -hmm. You're just like, Dan needs help. Mm -hmm. And they're yours. You were the songwriter. So on top of that, you understood the, you know, creative and um, emotional expression you're going for. Yeah. So in that one circumstance, you did the right thing, mm -hmm. which was, you just like gave me some things to play, to try. Mm. and uh, it saved it saved me it saved the energy for the whole track mm. because um at that one point i needed someone to write something for me <laughs> what can i say you know what i mean like it just helped and that that was awesome yeah um so yeah and i, I that you know that's that's interesting to bring that up because it's one strategy yeah just you know have something written yeah or or you know but but maybe it also brings up I'm watching the timer because we had planned to keep it under 30 minutes. We're at 20. We just hit 30. All right. Um, so uh, they, um, the, the, like just spitballing strategies. Like I, in that instant, one instance, I wrote a part for you, right? Mm -hmm. The, another way to write, the, well, another way to say that is a one strategy could be actually write a part out one strategy could be open yourself up to other inputs you know what i mean so maybe that's what maybe he goes over that in the book but it's like if you if if i i me as a guitar player i'm stuck on a part which i've been a million times in my life couldn't get through it yeah and i'm the guitar player nobody tells me what to do or whatever you know and i don't i don't feel that way but um but it's like maybe the clarinet player has a good idea for a part. Maybe the maybe the idea is not to play a part. Maybe the drummer, maybe the bass player has a good idea for a part. It's like you just have to be you have to go through the process of, you know, finding the idea and being open in some respects. I don't know. I'm just sort of like, you know, spitballing a little bit. Um so uh, the only thing is that uh since we're closing it up, I wrote some notes about what kind of what I want to get out of the book. And I, I thought as a producer and as an artist in general, I think there are certain things that I would aspire to be. And I wrote these just like these terms down. So number one is transparent. So as a producer, in some ways, in some situations, you don't, you want to get out of the way. Right. But also you want to be an artist in some respects you want to be able to put your artistry into the project where, where, where it's appropriate. But there's also a time where it makes sense to be, to, to serve as a mentor in some ways uh, to someone who's struggling or to yourself or a coach, how to coach someone through a tough part, you know, which I wish I had so many times. And then just being a creative in general, you know, what does that mean to be a creative, you know, or to be creative? So I don't know. 
Um, that's basically it. So I like this book, man. I'm psyched. Yeah, I, I'm uh, really psyched and um, I'm, I'm interested to see where it goes. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, sort of wrap this, this episode up mm -hmm. um, here a little bit by saying um, we'll be back soon and uh, we're going to do the next chapter. Hell yeah. Uh, our next, I'm going to say our next podcast is we're just going to jump right into it. Um, we're going to do a chapter and then maybe after that, we'll do a little, uh, reminiscing, a little, little, uh, quick podcast on some of some, uh, other stuff. But, um, I think mm -hmm. this book's going to be a great springboard for us. Um, and enjoying it so far. And again, we have, uh, affiliate links to the book below it, uh, like, and subscribe to our channel and our videos, share them with all your friends, um, bug out with us. We love it. Um, and, uh, I love that term. Please, bug out with us. Bug out with us, and please, 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 troll us really hard. We love that. Yeah, um, definitely troll us. We just can't get enough. <laughs> Keith, you want to want to add anything else before we go? No, no, I don't. I actually do love bug out with us. I feel like that should be our that should be our motto. Okay. But come bug out with us. You know what? Yeah. That's it. That's it, Actually, brother. I want to get a t-shirt that says, get you some productions, bug out with us. I love it. All right. <laughs> that's hilarious. Just like that. Awesome, brother. Dude, that's okay. great. All right. Ciao. All right, dude. Mwah. Bye. Later.